All right, really excited to be here. Last session of the day. Uh, we introduced the city of old world, new world. And uh, let's think about that for a minute. So we used to have catalogs like this. You wanted a book, you'd use a card catalog. You wanted a product like toys to delight the kitties. You might use the Sears Roebuck catalog. But now if you want a book or just about anything, you go to Amazon, right? And it looks like this. You've got a very, very rich page with stars and colors, and, and you can really make an informed decision. And uh, catalogs are really all around us. Today we're going to talk about how to make finding data, the right data asset in your organization, as easy as finding the right place to stay with Airbnb, the right person to hire on LinkedIn, the right restaurant to eat at with Yelp, uh, the right web page to read on Google, something like that. So real quick, uh, me and some logos. Um, I went to Stanford and studied symbolic systems for my uh, BS and MS, looking at uh, human-computer interaction and natural language processing. And that brought me over to Apple, where I did a bunch of things before landing inevitably on the Siri team, back when she looked kind of like that, doing engineering research and design, all very much informed by data, both big and small. And obviously, I can't say anything else, or they would uh, kill me. Um, but how about you guys? Who here is in DevOps or IT? Show of hands. OK, a good number of you. Who's uh, data scientists, data analysts, cool business folks? OK, awesome. Very diverse group. And one thing that might unite us, who here has used one of or all of Amazon, Yelp, Google? OK, cool. So we all know what catalogs are like in real life. And the question is now, how do we bring that to the data space? And my simple proposition is that a good data catalog will be just like a great modern catalog in other respects. So we're going to walk through what it is. Uh, spoiler alert, I'm going to suggest that a data catalog is a thing that helps with data consumption. So we'll spend another couple minutes talking about what data consumption is. And then the bulk of the talk, we'll talk about how to build a modern data catalog, both kind of philosophically and practically. So um, OK, was data catalog? Let's start bottom up with a few examples. This is an old space. You know, IBM and, and Microsoft uh, obviously been at this for a while. There's a renewed interest in catalogs with the advent of Hadoop, with folks like Zeloni and Waterline. Uh, Alation also plays in this space, but uh, there'll be more on us later on. And of course, there's really exciting stuff happening with you know, metadata open standards that all of us might um, grow to, to talk to with stuff like Joe Hellerstein is doing with Project Ground at Cal. Um, all of these sort of cataloging uh, technologies um, fit into this box. Um, this is sort of the way Gartner looks at the space where there's, you know, you've already are storing your uh, data, and you have a layer to compute um, over it. And the question then becomes, OK, how do you find, understand, and trust an asset in order to do computation? There, there might be a step of data transformation. You can use our partner Trifactor and numerous other companies for that. Or you might be able to find a raw asset that's already in the shape you want. But to find that needle of good data in the haystack of other data is, is the challenge. That's what catalogs help with. So one follow-up question is, well, there's these other terms floating around, data inventories, data dictionaries. These seem to also be kind of in that stage of finding, understanding, trusting. Uh, what's the difference? So again, I think it helps to forget the data part and think of what is an inventory. I've got two inventories stacked side by side here. This first one is an inventory of restaurants. And one thing you'll notice is you have to take my word for it, because you can't even tell what these are. It's just a, 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 a inventory of what's there and what's where. Each one of these things is a restaurant. It's got a location. And in a data inventory, you could track you know, where things are. Um, so in a relational database, you might have schema, table, column. In uh, Hadoop, you would have you know, a directory with files in it and you know, key value pairs. And you can kind of see, OK, here's what's around. Um, hard to know what it is you're looking at until you get a dictionary. Right? Dictionaries answer the basic what questions as of type and meaning. Right? So in a data dictionary, it'll say, oh, this, this strange thing is a big integer. And we can translate the hex and you know, put in some vowels and some spaces and say, OK, cool. That's what, uh, what this thing is. Um, over here in our uh, restaurant inventory, in our restaurant dictionary, we see, OK, these are both pizza places. Right? This is equivalent to like a data type. And they've got names, these logical titles. And I'll throw in a picture. And now you can recognize this is Yelp. Right? So, um, so far, so good. A dictionary helps us know what we're looking at. And uh, it can be really helpful if you know what you're looking for. It's like you know, putting Command or Control F on your computer. But it doesn't really help you with the consumability questions. You have to make a decision um, about, about what to, in this case, eat. Right? Do you want to go to Buca or Bebo? Somebody from out of town. These are both in San Jose, by the way. All right, no idea, right? Here's what Yelp actually does, because they're actually a catalog, and they're focused on the consumer. Right? They'll tell you how many people have been there, and what they thought of it, and how much it costs, and how far away it is from you, and how you can call them. And now the choice becomes really obvious. 
right? Bebo's is about twice as good and half as expensive and seven times closer than the other. And none of that was clear a second ago, right? So catalogs answer this, these questions that help us actually make decisions and help us with understanding and trust. And for data, then it might be information like, you know, is this deprecated or endorsed? How many people have used it recently? If I have a question, who can I ask? Kind of like this phone number. Uh, what are the right ways to query this thing or, 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 or descript it? And uh, like in Yup, it'll say, you know, must try the meatballs, right? So I think, um, I think there's a opportunity to go from inventory to dictionary to catalog. Inventories help suppliers, catalogs empower consumers. I think that's the bottom line. And so the question is, what information do you need to make a decision as a data consumer? Right? We know what we need to know about a restaurant. What do we have to know about a data asset? So this gets into the question of, of what is data consumption. We're going to show a bunch of questions in a second. I just want to quickly motivate this by saying, a day in the life of a data consumer, 75% um, of data scientists' time is spent doing this broader idea of data prep, finding, understanding, munging, preparing to use data. And coincidentally, 75% of data scientists say that's their least favorite part of their job. Right? So you have this phenomenon where your most uh, uh, difficult to hire, expensive to retain people <laughs> are spending most of their time doing their least favorite uh, and it's because of all of these different questions as a data consumer you have to ask before you can get down to actually working with data, which is what you were hired to do, those of you in the room who are, who are uh, uh, consumers, analysts or scientists. So um, the thing you ultimately do is you, is you run. You, know, you write um, a, a script in Pig or Python, or you write a, SQL, a, a, a query in SQL, and you want to eventually run it. Before you can run it, you have to write it. Before you write it, you have to plan it out. right? Um, and before you can even begin planning your query or your script, you have to familiarize yourself with the data, do all this research. And so running is really this tiny little piece at the end, which is why I think it's funny that when we talk about data optimization, um, and, or, or query optimization, rather, we're always talking about how to make the query run faster. That would be like saying, oh, I've noticed it takes PhD students a long time to finish their theses. Let's make faster printers. Right? What you really want to be doing is saying, how can we make the research more effective and more efficient? Um, and because there's all these questions, as I said. So first, you know, in your first few months on the job, we have a customer that says, even if you hire a data scientist with a PhD in stats and 10 prior years of work experience, just having them be able to answer these questions, what tables are important? Uh, how do I query the transactions table? What are the best practices here at this company? Um, that can take months to even over a year. Then you have to find a particular data asset for your task. And so which table contains order information? You don't know who does know. Um, which version is up to date? There's five versions. I know most of them are stale. Any of this sounding familiar? Hopefully you hear this a lot from our customers. Once you've found an asset that looks promising, you have to understand what it is so that you can use it and so you can trust that it's the right one, in fact, you're looking at. Where did it come from? How are the columns calculated? There might be different uh, um, fields that look very similar but are subtly different. There might be things that are just totally inscrutable at first glance. Right? And so again, you have to ask for all of this before you can finally get to the point where you plan your query, write it, and run it. And that requires saying, OK, what do I join on? What do I filter by? How do I calculate this metric? Um, there's questions of sort of should and may. There's correctness questions, like, oh, should I include Hawaii in my geographic filter? More on that later. There's compliance questions. Am I allowed to include gender? Right? Maybe I have to uh, for some aggregate stats, but I'm not allowed to if I'm trying to make a data product that's a, a classifier for, for credit. And that would be violating the FCRA. Right? So there's all these considerations, uniqueness, nulls, blah, 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 blah. I could literally fill this whole slide with questions. Um, so you have the trade off. You can either skip the questions and guess, and then you're quick, but you're not correct. Or you can you know, phone a friend, go on Slack, and then you're correct, but not quick. And our proposal is, well, what if you didn't have to make this trade off because you had a modern data catalog, right? Google, um, Amazon, you know, instant results, satisfying results. You don't have to pick and choose. Um, so to build a modern catalog, I summarize the um, basic theory here as behavior IO, right? We're making catalogs not just for the heck of it. We want to change behavior and improve behavior, make data consumption more accurate, more efficient. How are we going to accomplish that? Um, well, <laughs> we want to observe the behavior that's already happening. Right? So the observation is the input, and the behavior change is the output. Um, why uh, is this important? Well, here's a question for the audience, quick poll. There's a restaurant shown here. Is it delicious? Any guesses? So it thinks it is. It says so three times. 
in a big font. Do we trust that? Would we trust that if it disagreed with what was said on a source like Yelp, right? So there's a strong intuition that what an entity says about itself is rarely as reliable as what others say about it, right? Or how others relate to it. And the same holds for data. If I find I'm um, wandering around my Hadoop cluster, my data warehouse, stumbling in the dark, and I find this file, Q3 results, final, final, final. Is it final? <laughs> right? And it doesn't matter how many times it says it. I want some third party verification. Right? So that could be three data stewards endorsed it. That's the direct up equivalent. Or it could be something a little more subtle, like, oh, it turns out that this CSV was used to produce a dashboard that the CFO used on his quarterly earnings call. So I sure hope it was final. Right? Um, so anyway, getting this third party information is really useful. And the reason you can't necessarily just do it purely Yelp style is that that might not scale. Right? There's only so many restaurants. There's a lot. There's only so many. Let's think about the web. right? Billions and billions of web pages, right? an infinite number almost of possible permutations of search terms. How can we find a reputable website where we can find a delicious restaurant? Well, here's a page that probably would have scored really high back on Lycos or AltaVista right? in the Wobegon days before Google. Right? Uh, I looked up acai berries through Out of Towners. This is a big thing in California from what I can gather, and I've stemmed it here to uh, match berry and berries. And you'll notice that this uh, string occurs 15 times, pretty well distributed. So for you know, search geeks among you, high TF IDF here. And it's delicious, delicious, delicious. Right? It, the term appears in these big, red, bold phrases. Right? And, um, and back in the day, this is how search engines worked. You would look at just how many times something is said and kind of what HTML tags are around it. Is it bold? Is it strong? Is it in the header? Um, and so a page like this wouldn't do so well, right? Because it just says a Cyberry three times in small font. And yet somehow, Google is able to rank Wikipedia high and the free report, the spammy one, low. And we all know how this works. So this is page rank, right? which I'm sure everyone in this room has read about. And the idea is, instead of waiting for humans to tell you what they trust explicitly and invest their time in that, you can mine the passive signals they've left behind through their behavior, right? So webmasters, you know, they weren't compiling uh, uh, re re reviews, excuse me, uh, Yelp style. They were just making links for their own human audiences, not trying to help Google, not trying to help you they haven't met. But the computer was able to aggregate all of that signal and, and surface it to give these really good search results. And this is uh, very innovative, but it's also very familiar. In fact, we've all done this, right? Back when we looked a little bit more like her. Right? So uh, imagine trying to learn a foreign language now. Right? You would go to a night class. Uh, you're not very happy to be there. Neither is the teacher. There's this laborious process with vocab sheets and conjugation charts. Right? Whereas if I drop her in you know, Romania, she will learn Romanian by age two right? with her amazing baby brain, observing what mom says to dad, what dad says to the milkman, if they have that there. I don't know. The point is. It's, it, it's communication acts being done by people for their own reasons. Uh, she eavesdrops. She spies. She assimilates all of that and then is able to make novel utterances, interpret novel utterances. She builds this whole model from these signals that are being left behind. This is exactly what Amazon is doing with its recommendations that have gotten them so much revenue and acclaim. Right? If I buy two or three O'Reilly texts, I'm not doing it to help Amazon you know, hawk their wares. I'm not doing it to help you, you know, get a book you didn't know you need. I'm just doing it because I want both books. And Amazon is able to observe that and aggregate it. Um, and and they make everyone's experience better. Right? So there's a lot of power with looking at the people's behavior as input to then drive their behavioral effort down the line. This is my favorite example. It really just is end to end and, and brings in a little more nuance. So uh, Yelp did this thing where they built a classifier. Um, they probably bootstrapped sort of words like food poisoning and then extended to find all, all evidence in this unstructured data of people getting food poisoning from different restaurants. Um, they used that to actually send little push notifications, I think this started in San Diego, to say, hey, health inspectors, something seems to be up at Bebo's Pizza. And uh, by the way, I, I don't think they're at all unsafe. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, whatever restaurant it happened to be, uh, they would then do the little health inspection with the official clipboard checklist, everything. And if there was a low score on the health inspection report, they would then push uh, a, a push notification basically in the app 
to all their users. Now they're modifying the behavior of their future users based on the past. And this helps those users, obviously. What's really cool is it also empowers those health inspectors. Right? And the analogy in the data world is you've got data stewards, data curators, data owners who are doing all this work to document data that no one ever sees. Right? So I think the equivalent is you know, the health inspector's report often is like posted in the back by the bathroom. You don't even see it until you're already kind of having the food poisoning. Um, and this is just a fun example I saw online where in New York, where you're required to put it in your window, people get creative <laughs> with uh, what they post next to it. So the point is um, we can use uh, the wisdom of the crowds to kind of get some signal, convert that into an expert recommendation, and then push the recommendation in a way where it's actually going to impact change. So it's kind of a win-win-win for the curators, for the consumers, um, and for the platform. So uh, to get more concrete in the, in the data E side of things, um, here is an Alation instance at one of our customers. I have blurred out all the sensitive information, but we can still kind of walk through this one example here. Uh, of behavior IO in action. So uh, basically, I'm an analyst. I'm trying to do a new project in a domain I'm not familiar with. I want to find a table in the schema, including this keyword. So what's happening here is this, these uh, you know, goldish bars here are all of the different matches for this uh, filter term in the schema. right? And um, what you'll notice is there's a lot of them. right? I was told, oh, find this. I'm like, wait, which one? There's prefixes, there's suffixes. Uh, which is the one that I want to use? In just a data dictionary, you just have the physical name. You would have the, uh, the logical title, uh, maybe some, some metadata here. But that's it, and it's very hard to decide, like we saw back when Yelp didn't have anything except the addresses and the, the names uh, and the, the um, type of cuisine. But here, what we've done is we've produced this popularity column using Behavior I.O. We've mined all the query logs and found all the statements, who ran them. We parsed the content to see what objects are mentioned. And we therefore were able to say how many distinct users, how many times, how recently have used each of these tables. And uh, we call it popularity because we're you know, trying to be cool. But this is an idea called frequency. It's a hybrid of frequency and recency to get kind of what's trending. And it's exactly the same thing that powers my uh, browser bar. Right? When I go to A, I get the, the top sites I go to most often, our Jira instance, Alation, and Amazon, because it knows this is where I go often and where I go recently. This is the same idea, but generalized to the social signal across the entire company. Because the goal here is to make each data consumer as knowledgeable as all the data consumers combined. Right? Individual consumers might make mistakes, might have different needs than me. But in aggregate, there's a rhythm of the crowd that emerges. And what you'll notice here is we've ranked by popularity by default. This column over here, this is like the health inspector. Okay, these are explicit endorsements by data stewards on this source. And what you'll notice is the most you know, officially endorsed table is also the most popular. And the second most officially endorsed one, and this is, this is real, this is a customer, we didn't doctor this, is the second most. And so you actually see that in this case, the official approval is a lagging indicator. The first evidence we see is actually what's happening organically. Um, from the usage. And that's the behavior input side. And of course, on the output side, if one day we want to deprecate this table in favor of this one, well, then we slap a big red uh, uh, deprecation here. And because all the consumers are going here, the way you kind of can't help but go to Yelp after a certain point, I'm fading at least, we can then change behavior and watch the popularity follow the, uh, the expert advice. So that's behavior I.O., right? In short, it means in a modern catalog, you employ mixed methodologies with humans and computers together to observe, to aggregate, and to surface all the prior uh, data consumption uh, information in order to make the future data consumption efficient and accurate. Cool. So that's how overall you build a modern data catalog. Now, there's two kind of uh, shifts in mindset to get there. And one is more philosophical, and the next is practical. Philosophically, there's this idea of the continuum of control. Right? There's constantly a tension organizations between trying to decide what people should be doing. And that can be really critical in certain verticals. Uh, uh, finance and healthcare especially come to mind, highly regulated, um, high stakes. Um, but on the other hand, you can say, let's just describe what people are actually doing. Right? We see here a little camera observing someone filtering data, searching data, inserting a row, migrating data. These people all leave behind footprints in the logs. And you can kind of observe that and, and run with it. And so our hunch here is to say, maybe before you try to decide what everyone should be doing, describe what's happening, and you can learn a lot of insight. In fact, sometimes users can decide for themselves. Right? Imagine if Yelp said, um, we know what's best for people. This is a good intuition. They want to have good value. So they want high star ratings and low cost. 
And that's exactly what I want. I want to go out for a tire Mexican uh, on a normal night. I don't want to spend too much money. But then the next day, if it's Valentine's Day, suddenly, right, I want to go to a steakhouse and spend a lot of money, right? And so I know my context. And if you can provide enough context about the data, I can make the right choice for me. In addition to context over time, there's context by team. So uh, a very wise man once told me that point of view is really important in interpreting anything. And uh, here's a quick example. These are two representations of the United States that are fairly abstract. Um, this one on the left uh, is focused on unity. And this little star here represents the state of Hawaii. Right? It's the 50th state. And you notice it's the same size and about equidistant as the rest. Whereas in this representation, we see that it's smaller and farther away and it, you know, different properties come forward. Which one is, is a better representation? Well, if I'm in the accounting team um, and I'm trying to calculate federal taxes, then anything that happens in Hawaii happens in the US. right? No difference. So my geographic taxonomy will group them. right? Whereas if I'm over here in the ops team, I can ship to Alaska or to New York by train. But if I want to ship to Hawaii, I have to ship by ship. right? And so I might group Hawaii with Guam and Puerto Rico and the, and the, the territories. Right? And they're both equally valid, but they're different. So instead of having IT tell me, let's all speak the same language, we must use one or the other, right? we can just observe that Al and Bonnie and Clyde over in finance all use this definition. And so then Dale can join them. And Xavier and Yvonne and Zelda all use this definition over in ops. And so William can join them. And everyone's happy. And we only have to make this hard decision about which one is right if there's some special joint project where they're trying to send a shipload of money to Guam. So this idea is aggregating before dictating. right? Instead of making a decision for your users, um, see what's going on. So uh, in this case, there's not two right answers. There's one right answer. And it actually bubbles to the surface um, even, again, before a steward can get involved in something manual. Right? We see here this is a, a, a state uh, filter being done. And um, northeast is where people want to filter a lot. Um, so they've filtered by, uh, filtered by state 700 plus times. And the plurality of the time, they use this uh, 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 set here, which includes Vermont. And less often, they use the one that forgets Vermont. So now, thankfully, a steward has come in and pointed this out, and it's very obvious. But if I'm stuck, oh, which one should I use? I can just look and say, oh, look, here's a more popular one. Here's another popular one. Oh, I see. This is the difference, right? So again, by aggregating, we don't necessarily need to dictate. Um, critical point here is, is not always democracy, direct democracy isn't always the best system. We might want to wait by who's doing it, right? If the, uh, if the you know, expert in the company on geography is using this definition, you know, we might go there instead. So, but we can take a weighted average to get the right behavior. So a cool thing about this adoption of descriptivism, trying to just describe everything thoroughly instead of trying to have humans manually figure out all the rules, is um, you can, you can um, find a nice equilibrium in this context you've had this whole time between efficiency and accuracy. Right? In the BI space, if you really care about accuracy, which might be totally vital, you can't ever make a mistake in certain verticals, you would have an old school uh, BI tool with a semantic layer. Right? So somebody figures out the right definition, and nobody can deviate from it. And you avoid this horrible problem where the VP you know, in separate meetings says, oh, the KPI is double here what it is here. This is all garbage. Right? Seeing some nice people have had that experience. It's sort of terrifying, right? Um, however, in, in a less regulated industry, we see this mass migration to tools like Tableau. Where people say, look, I can't wait for IT to make this new metric or this new dimension. Um, I want to you know, make my own access label how I want. And you get a lot of efficiency and empowerment at the expense of that, that trust, maybe, right? Because some of the reports are accurate and some are not. People are given a little more rope to hang themselves with. So what I think is cool if you adopt the descriptivist approach is you can do what we call regulation on read. That I can say, OK, uh, with Tableau, I've got 100 different uh, uh, charts with different definitions of profit. right? And they can't all be right. But I can see that this definition of profit is used in, in, in uh, visualizations that are produced by the best people in my company many, many times recently, whereas the long tail are produced by you know, summer interns three years ago. And so I can figure out what I can trust versus not as an informed consumer without having to stop problems before they're even made with, uh, with a top-down approach. So that's the idea of descriptivism. So there's clearly a lot that can be uh, learned um, from, uh, from people. How do we kind of get all that information in on a practical level? I suppose that there's five critical techniques that need to be layered and ultimately combined to really produce this descriptive catalog. Um, the first thing we have to do is automatically crawl and parse and index 
all the sources of data in our organization. Right? And to do that, um, kind of how Google indexes the web or um, Amazon uh, does their own uh, product catalog. And we need to not just limit ourselves to the data itself, but look also at the BI tools, at the wikis, at the usage logs, every source of information we can find. Next, on top of that, we can apply old school uh, de 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 deterministic approaches with AI and inference to get more um, knowledge about the data and insight. And then more uh, contemporary statistical approaches like machine learning and natural language processing um, to even further kind of broaden what, what, what we're aware of. Crowds can help too to supplement. They can kind of add their own content manually in addition to what can be gleaned from their past behavior. And finally, experts can go and kind of balance out some of that comprehensiveness and breadth with, with, with correctness and quality. So we can layer these all and then combine them all to make a catalog. Let me show you how that looks. I'm going to build a catalog up layer by layer. This is the Strata conference after all. So here's how a data asset looks in the beginning. Right? It's kind of a haze. Um, you don't really know. And we need to bring into focus and add clarity and color by doing these different layers. First, we use metadata extraction to see if this is a relational table. We see what schema it's in and what columns are in it. Then we can do data sampling to produce some sample rows and histograms per value. Right, it's kind of like the look inside on an Amazon page. Then we can build a language model of all the different vocabulary in the organization um, uh, based on what we see in the wikis and the BI uh, labels and everything, and use that to expand uh, abbreviations like sum to summary, to expand initialisms like DRG, diagnosis related groups. And this helps a little bit to know what you're looking at and a lot to find things um, in an English in, uh, answered out, uh, English in answers out sort of way. Um, and then we do query log ingestion, which, as you mentioned, gives us popularity. It can give us not just how many users, but who they are in particular. These top users are good candidates to be stewards, people who can ask for help. We also get the filters view you saw a minute ago. Um, we can see joins, no longer hunting around for the right on condition, getting the wrong results because you lack it. We can get lineage, see where things came from, where they're going. We can propagate problems across uh, uh, lineage uh, streams. Um, so all of this comes from looking at the logs in the behavior I.O. way. We get all of this rich information you see here on day zero, before a single human has lifted a finger to intentionally make the catalog better. Right? All of this comes from reading the signals they left behind and synthesizing it with AI and ML and, and, and uh, automated ingestion. Then on day one, once you actually bring humans in, they can then go in and write descriptions and add tags. You can assign stewards. Stewards can do endorsements. And you get this really rich, colorful picture. So that's a data catalog. Those are the different parts that go into it. Now, how do you um, combine these parts? Right? It's not enough to just kind of glom them all together. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics. I could go on forever, but we don't have very much time left. Um, I would encourage you to stop by our booth to learn more about some of the ways that machines can help with uh, data cataloging and to read uh, Louis Fanon's papers about how machines can learn from people playing games. But today, we're going to talk about this paradigm in which machines guess and people confirm. There's a lot of players in this space, including in the consumer catalog space. Right? Everyone's seen this page on LinkedIn. This can come as a nomination from a person, or it can be something that's, that's machine learned, but then uh, humans can provide feedback. On Netflix, its machine learning algorithm will uh, guess how much you like a movie, and you can give it feedback. And what's cool is in all these cases, that feedback the human gives not only is helpful to other humans directly, but is training data for the machine learning, and is more facts that, that, that an uh, inference engine can build upon. Um, so this is happening, of course, in the data space. One amazing example, which is now boxed up in uh, Trifactor Wrangler, but uh, they wrote about the, the uh, Trifactor founders when they were in academia during this project that was called Data Wrangler, is you can give an example of, OK, I want to uh, um, uh, split out this phrase here, Alaska, in this sentence. And then it's going to guess, oh, are you trying to cut from position 18 to position 24? If so, you would get Arizona instead of Arizona and Arkansas instead of Arkansas. And then when they provide an, a different example with Arizona, it says, oh, now I have a new guess of what you're trying to do. Right? I guess that uh, you want to take everything from in till the end of the line. And when you push this green button, it adds it to your transform list. And um, what happens is the computer then learns. Right? It can now apply your change to this entire document. And it can also learn that, in general, it's more likely you're going to want to go from close to the end to the end. And it gets smarter. And we do the same thing in elation. 
I mentioned this a couple slides ago, the idea of building this language model based on all the English in your organization to kind of learn the way a baby learns a, a, a natural language. Um, corporate language can be learned by a computer. Ali, the relation robot here, can learn BUS stands for business, auth stands for author authorizing. This yellow head means she's not sure. When you push the green check, it's providing um, further evidence that you're right, and then she can apply that to building this automatic data dictionary, expanding um, those words where they occur in, in context. Right? So, um, so that's Ali, the Alation uh, AI bot, a little more on her later. And of course, a lot of people in, in the data space here at this conference are doing this, including uh, Tamer and Pexala and others. So be sure to check, check them out. So OK, we've covered a lot. And coming out of Apple, I can't help but say one more thing. <laughs> um, and we've addressed the what and the how, so I want to just talk about the why real quick. So I think our customers can say this much better than we can. And in fact, I was very privileged to be able to watch Dev say this here in the audience, give an amazing talk early this afternoon. Hopefully, some of you saw that. Um, go watch it when the video comes out. It's really amazing. And I, she can say it much better than I can what's happened at eBay. Real quick example from Safeway, they were recently acquired and there was a push away from sort of digital marketing you know, driven by data science to old school coupon use. And they were able to use Alation uh, Catalog, first of all, um, to, to make a data product to give really good recommendations, but more importantly to run the analytics to prove that the ROI of their system was better than what the acquiring company wanted to do. And they said something like uh, a 30x ROI on the cost of the software just in the first week from having that project not killed. So I think there's some really cool things happening uh, when you can um, democratize data and have, have behavior I.O. in a catalog. So real quick, what you just saw. Catalogs aid consumption. Consumption is finding, understanding, and trusting data, being able to answer all the questions you have about an asset. If you remember nothing else, remember behavior I.O., right? You can describe all prior data consumption to improve all future data consumption. The input and the output are both human, excuse me, but the, the core can be done largely by machines collaborating with people. Um, you want to have perceptivism sometimes, but there's a lot that you can do by describing. So before you decide, describe. Can we do this all together? Before you dictate. Activate. OK, we had one. Thank you. <laughs> you get a few margarita later. <laughs> um, before you to aggregate. And finally, you put all this together with human computer collaboration. Machines can watch and learn. Machines can guess. People can confirm. And it's a virtuous cycle. So this is what we've learned. What a catalog is, it's for consumption. And you can use people and computers to make a modern catalog really well. So I'm the last thing between you all and beer. So I'm going to wrap this up very quickly. In case you still have somehow outstanding questions about data cataloging after this marathon session, um, I'm an Alation guy, and this is an O'Reilly talk. So both the O'Reilly and Erlation blog have some articles that talk about parts of this. These slides will be sent out later, but you're welcome to Google this or photograph it now if you're in a rush. But much better than reading, you can experience the magic live. Here is Allie in real life. She is dancing at our booth right now, which is 741. I'm heading there after this talk for um, office hours, where I'll be enjoying some margaritas that are there. This is actually true. And they're going to taste really good, experts say. So uh, definitely show up for that. Um, or alternatively, our partners at Teradata are hosting our incredible head of marketing, Stephanie, one of our great senior engineers, for um, a data cataloging demo that uh, will extend some of these in this talk. So we encourage you to do those. Um, thank you so much for your time. And uh, I have a few minutes to answer um, some questions you might have, about, about six minutes. And if you don't have time for the question or you're shy, my initials happen to be ASK. And so you can tweet at me with these uh, hashtags, and I will try to get back to you soon. Thanks so much. I'm just blazingly clear. Ben. OK, hi. Uh, I have a question. Is access control built in at Alation? Say, for example, if you have HR data and you don't want anyone even see the column names, like how, how is that part regulated in Alation? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's different kinds of security for data itself and for metadata. So a very common HR example is you can see the column names and descriptions, but you can't see the actual contents. 
So a good strategy often companies want to employ is to say whatever is being handled in the data itself, like if I couldn't write the query, I shouldn't then be able to see it in relation. So you can kind of enforce the policies of the RDBMS um, or the file system. Um, for metadata, there's another approach where you can sort of take, um, uh, basically assign rules based on the policy that makes sense with either your IT department or your governance department, something like that. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. Okay. Okay, thanks a bunch.